Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Teacher Talk Time, session two regarding self-assessment. We'll be starting here in just a few minutes. If you'd like to take this time to check your audio equipment, you can do so by clicking on the down arrow at the top right-hand corner of your screen, going through a series of checks uh, to make sure that you have uh, an active mic. If you have a video, you can check that and also check your uh, speakers or check the sound coming through your speakers. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Hello Helena, welcome. Uh, just getting started here, if you'd like to take uh, this time to check your audio equipment, if you could let me know if uh, the sound's coming through okay for you. And if you do have a mic for phone today and you'd like to speak, uh, feel free uh, to type in the word mic in the chat box and I'll activate your mic. Also if you have um, a webcam, Great. If you have a webcam also, if you would uh, let me know, I'll be more than happy also to activate your webcam. Go ahead and activate your mic now if you'd like to say hello and just uh, check out uh, your equipment. Hello. Hi. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. This Helena. is Poland. This is Poland. <laughs> Hi, Benjamin. Can you hear me well? Yes. Just fine. Hello? Can you? Yeah, yes. perfect. Okay. Would you and like for me to yeah, activate... let's just wait for the others. Okay. Would you like for me to activate your webcam? Yeah. Yeah, you may. Okay, let's see. Great, excellent. I'm in my basement. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Yo, you're in your basement? And where is Yeah, this is my study in my basement. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, welcome. Thanks for... Because uh, we have very many. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you're from Mexico now? Yes, uh, I'm in Aguas Calientes, Mexico. It's uh, 7.04 in the morning. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. this is where I'm located. Originally from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. But uh, have been living here in Aguas Calientes okay. for about uh, 12 years now. And uh, okay. where, where are you located? And, uh, okay, I'm listening to you. Uh, I'm sorry, Helena, where are you uh, calling from? Where are you located? I'm in Poland, mm -hmm. the Great. central European country, Poland, mm -hmm. and uh, Wrocław. This is the southwest Poland, the name of the city is Wrocław. It used to be called Breslau. But Great. nowadays, since 1945, it's Polish. Okay. Okay, we can see the front. 
Hello, George. George Welcome. King. I went ahead and activated King. your mic. And uh, if you would like for me to activate your webcam, I'll be more than happy to do that as well. Uh, I'm not sure how many webcams and mics we can have active at once. Uh, George is the expert here in uh, the platform, but we'll we'll see what what happens. Um, Helena, I, could you just let us know or kind of explain your teaching context? What do you teach? Uh, what age groups? Uh, if you would wouldn't mind sharing that. What? Okay. Sure. I teach uh, the students at university, so the age group would be from 18 to sometimes 30 years old, and uh, this is my major uh, the teaching Polish as a second language. But uh, also I teach English as a second language, and the, the, in this case, my students are from five years old to 45, 50, <laughs> and I use a lot of music in my teaching. Great. So this is about me. Thank you. Thanks. Great. I'm muting my mic. Okay. Right? Hello, George. If you'd like to say hello. Good morning. Seems uh, like the mics are a little low. I don't know if it's just me or if it's my speakers, but seems like your mics are a little low. But I'll see if I can change that on this end. Um, okay. All right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, thank you all for, for joining this live session, Teacher Talk Time. Uh, this is uh, session number two, uh, where we'll be talking about self-assessment. Teacher Talk Time is for basically anyone who's interested in educational uh, theory and practice, basically. Uh, looking at uh, both in-service and pre-service educators, trainers, administrators, uh, bas basically any educational stakeholders. And uh, we uh, encourage them to, to share experiences and opinions through uh, this open discourse, this open and diverse and respect respectful dialogue. So basically, Teacher Talk Time uh, is an open forum uh, and each week I, try, I do my best not to dominate the conversation to give uh, basically to post questions about some interesting readings that I come across each week and uh, those readings that I come across each week are posted uh, in this link here at the bottom where you can also contribute to topics that we cover uh, during uh, teacher talk time and it's basically a Deagle list where you can go in and uh, make comments and see some of the topics that are coming up. In a few minutes, I'll show you uh, a web page where you'll also uh, have access to these topics that you can view. And so, yeah, welcome and thanks uh, for being here, George and Alina. Thanks for those who are watching this recording. In the event you do have to leave early, uh, these sessions are being recorded and uh, so feel free to access them uh, later on if need be through WizIQ. So typically what I do is I'll I jump back and forth between doing a screen share and uh, conducting conversations and dialogues through WizIQ platform. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, okay George, uh, yeah George is making a comment about the new TED-Ed which we talked about last week. I'm not sure George if you happen to see a recording. Uh, would you like to say a few words about TED-Ed before we get started? I plan to um, experiment with it for <coughs> um, the pandemic. Okay, George, I don't hear you. If you want to activate your mic or yeah, I'm not... Uh, getting any audio from you at all, so I'm not sure if there's something at your end. If you want to check your audio setup. But nothing still? There we go. If you could turn it up just a okay. bit though, if there's a way to turn up the volume of your microphone. Because it seems kind of low. I played with some settings and now I am in trouble. There we go. That's okay. Uh, 
I, I have not looked deeply on it. Um, I'll try to find your discussion from last week, but um, uh, I want to experiment with it maybe in a couple of weeks for academic English uh, related to TOEFL type um, students who have to be able to listen to, analyze, and present, for instance, in a TOEFL exam uh, for academic purposes, which is a very geeky and non-normal English that um, I expect to have them do that flip classroom, um, review, answer some questions, and try to analyze. And then during the class, they would present the information uh, in their own words of the um, TED video. So that's what I want to experiment with on that. Great. Uh, yeah, you might uh, you might want to check out uh, last week's session of Teacher Talk Time. Uh, we talked about uh, TED Ed and uh, basically came up we came through or discussed a few blog entries. Some were against TED Ed, and basically we had a, a conversation about the value of TED Ed and how it could work in the classroom. So you might find that uh, useful, George, and those who want to know a little bit more about TED Ed. Um, personally, I, I kind of like it. It's it's versatile. It's flexible. You can input the, your own questions. You can basically uh, use any YouTube video and incorporate in that into what they refer to as a lesson. And uh, you can have open or closed questions. You can monitor the progress of the students. So I don't know. I, I, I kind of like it. I think uh, what they're doing there is is, is good. And uh, I think it's at least worth uh, checking out. Would, what I found most um, interesting. One of the things at the Khan Academy that I think is just revolutionary is that tracking system for independent student um, progress so that a teacher can quickly access the history of the students' individual modules and quickly focus in on any problem areas. And I, they have not been looking at language or particularly um, teaching English as a foreign language but it looks like TED Ed is giving us those tools to monitor um, individual progress. So I'm particularly interested in that for independent students, which is almost exclusively what we deal with online for teaching students. All right, I'll listen now. Great, no, excellent. And uh, you know, perhaps you can come back after you've had a chance to look at it and use it in some of your classes to share some of your experiences uh, and opinions on that. Great. All right, I'll go ahead and uh, start uh, my screen share. Alina, did you want to add anything else before we get started? Again, this is a open, pretty open forum. I usually come in with information, but again, um, the preference here is that uh, we talk about what's on your mind. So, Alina, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I am here to learn, basically, because uh, I've been using different media to teach and uh, online classes in VTQ are my favorite and I'm just preparing myself to schedule the course, summer course, uh, English course. So I'm uh, watching and trying to find the new methods. So I'm your student. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> great. I, well, I think we're all uh, learning uh, together, so uh, great. Glad to have you both here. So. I'll go ahead and start the screen share, and uh, I'm still getting used to the new format here at WizIQ, so hopefully there will be, uh, we won't experience any glitches here on my end. All right, so I've just activated my screen share, so all of you should be able to see. I'll start here. This is uh, the EduWiki homepage. And I mentioned earlier, this is where you can find topics that we'll be discussing during Teacher Talk Time. Uh, and so feel free to, to check this out. And uh, you can also access the upcoming classes that are scheduled through WizIQ. So this is just uh, to make it a little bit more convenient for those who uh, wish to follow the topics uh, being, being discussed in Teacher Talk Time, as well as uh, either listen to recordings later on or participate in the live sessions. Okay, so 
before we get started here, yesterday I was in a session in WizIQ. In fact, thanks to George, he prompted me to um, to enter a session that uh, basically I was I came across or they discussed this website here, and I wanted to share this very quickly, and <clears throat> because uh, I think this is a great uh, initiative here. It's called the a Flat Classroom Project, and uh, for anyone. Uh, basically who wants to look for online projects that they wish to get involved with uh, this is a very good website and so I, I just wanted to share this uh, before we get started uh, to invite any of those higher education or edu educators in higher ed uh, who wish to collaborate and work uh, with other teachers to check out this website and uh, see if there's anything uh, here that uh, you might be interested in uh, getting involved with Okay, so the topic of today is self-assessment. And I came across this article in Inquire Within, and I want to read a few excerpts from this website, pose a few questions, and then we'll jump back to discussions. Um, they mention in this, in this blog here, it says, if students are going to be equipped with skills to cover, uh, to overcome the obstacles of challenges in their future, they need a change to learn how to fail and then reflect to take the next action. So the title of this blog, Schools Should Be Places Where Students Can Fail, um, that's where I wanted to start today with. I wanted to come across or discuss this idea of should we set up systems or institutions or even private classes where students fail? And if so, what would that look like? How would we treat that as, as educators? Um, they go on to say, if students can learn to set goals, plan pathways of action to reach those goals, reflect on the successfulness of the action and repeat, they will begin to develop a mental model for dealing with failures in the classroom. So the question that they pose is, now do you think the same thing should be true for teachers and administrators? Should schools be place, places where people can fail. So we basically have two issues here. <clears throat> should, should we set up institutions, classes, private classes where students fail? And from an educator standpoint, should schools also be places where teachers fail? And if so, what would that look like? And how would that be dealt with uh, among all educational uh, stakeholders? So we basically have these two perspectives on self-assessment here to get started from the teacher standpoint and the student standpoint. This article also references this, art, this uh, blog um, where they, they mention or they say the following, I think I was always comfortable with the idea of students choosing their own topics or con concepts for inquiry, but I was never able to come up with many good assessments that allowed for good student initiated action. So this, uh, this post here, they pose a problem here of coming up with good assessments uh, for, for the student, for them to actually take action, for them to be more participative uh, and more active in their own learning. They say, most likely we teachers want control. If we let students run free, then how will we ensure that they've learned? So again, we have this issue of control. Who's, who's in control? So this, should the students be more in control or the teachers be more in control? Finally, they mention here, students will be allowed to decide what objectives they want to meet. So if we give them more control, then they set their own goals. How will they demonstrate them? Uh, let's see, how will they demonstrate they met them. How and when will they be ex assessed? Who will their audience be? They will be free to choose more while I spend more time directing rather than dictating and learning. So a lot of things here to unpack. We have this idea of let going and give, giving more control to the students. Uh, we have this issue of teacher roles. If we're going to be taking more of a didactic role or more of a facilitative role, uh, so, again, a lot of things here to, to look at. Uh, there's one last thing that they mention in these, these two articles here is this idea of, of cycle of inquiry. 
And uh, I've seen this cycle uh, through action research projects for students, I'm sorry, for teachers who want to, I guess, improve their own practice. Uh, but the same diagram could also be applied, I think, to students with a little bit of, of change. The way it reads now is that, for example, the teacher would set up a vision, teaching and learning. Uh, they might formulate a researchable question based on some problem that they face. They design instruction. They teach and collect data. They analyze the data. And then they uh, reflect on the implications uh, and what those mean in terms of change in practice. But I think the same cycle could also be applied to students. So before we dry, I guess talk too much about this uh, this particular diagram, let me jump back and uh, get some of your thoughts about this issue of control, I guess, control in the classroom. And what are your initial feelings here about trying to set up or uh, letting the students fail in your in your classes? or in your schools. So what are your initial reactions when uh, regarding regarding failure in the classroom? So I see we have some other uh, people who have joined the class. Uh, welcome. And if you'd like for me to activate your mic, feel free to indicate that in the chat box. I'll be more than happy to activate your mic. So Alina, I don't know if you'd like to, if you have any comments about this idea of uh, students failing in the classroom and what, what that would look like, what type of assessment or feedback do you provide or support do you uh, provide to the students? Yeah, first of all, I don't like my students to be failing. And I think this is my responsibility to make them pass because this is me who teaches them. So uh, I'm not very much focused on the failure during the teaching process. Uh, just uh, the opposite. I want them to be very successful. And each time I run the classes and each time I have my meetings with my students, because even I do not like the term class or the lesson, uh, I, I, I'd rather use the term meetings with my students. It's probably because they are all adults and I want them to feel that I respect them and uh, no matter what they say, I would uh, say, okay, you have the right to talk like this, I have different perspective, but you need to know certain things. And I'm kind of, first of all, I, I try to make friends with my students, and then I try to have a very open communication with them. And for some reason, because I'm not a very strict uh, academic teacher that I give the test, then I, I give the grades and then I teach and then they learn and then <coughs> no way. This is totally different. I run the classes through communication methods so we talk a lot and we did discuss a lot even though I run the language classes. This could be a, a kind of surprising to you that I do not use the traditional methods. We have communication, and if somebody is failing, we, the group, with me, because I am facilitator more than the teacher, I am the tutor more than instructor, uh, so we discuss it, and we, we would talk about it. For example, Maria, you didn't learn. Maria, you're not going to cope with us. You're not going to fit into our community. You better do something about it. Maybe somebody should help you. And this is the way I 
do. I I cope with the students who are lazy or maybe yeah. So the failure is something that I do really want to avoid. Of course, some of my students when they have to take the exam and they didn't learn, they fail the exam. And I'm very upset when I have this kind of situation. So I am directing them. Uh, they are under my control, but they don't feel it. I do everything to, uh, to make it smooth. Of course, this is my duty to run the class, to be the leader, but I make them to cooperate. And uh, maybe for now, this is what I can tell you. And I will be glad to talk later. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alina. Thank you for your comments. George, would you like to add anything? The only thing I wanted to add, which isn't specific to your question about failure, um, was the teacher control quote that you put in there. I find almost 95% of the time when a teacher comes online to start teaching classes in the virtual classroom is that it's not about, I think, their control issue, but their comfort level and their understanding of how to use the tools and the totally new world of virtual classes such that um, they don't want to have things go bad, so therefore they don't allow students to participate. One of the coolest things that ever happened to me was early on in Liz IQ, had students that were just chatting away in the chat box and distracting, distracting. I gave the, a couple of these students writing control, and, and at first they continued the distracting um, extraneous stuff on the whiteboard. But pretty quickly, through just a little bit of prompting, they started supporting me, becoming a, a, a support system by typing notes on the whiteboard, um, reiterating um, main points, and even capturing um, pictures from the internet and bringing them into the classroom. So that simply by becoming more comfortable with the tools and the new world of virtual classrooms, a student that tends to you would want not to lose control over can be co-opted to become a collaborator with you. And then about the failure that um, Helena brought up, I believe the main reason for failure is miscommunicating goals, which I know that Ben is very big on with his nuanced um, ways of dealing with students. But if you're not agreeing to what the goals are in a student's or anybody's purpose of coming together, then there is naturally going to be a failure of individual goals because there's never been a, an agreement on where we're trying to go. So um, I, would, I don't want to own failure necessarily the way many teachers would. All right, I think that was enough. Yeah, that's, that's a good uh, point too, the idea of setting goals and agreeing on the goals. And uh, I think this kind of addresses the issue of control as well as uh, how do you negotiate these goals with the students? For those who are working in an institution where there's a syllabus, there's a curriculum, uh, you perhaps have pre-established goals. Uh, if you're teaching privately, uh, perhaps there's more flexibility. But uh, the question remains is how do you negotiate that? Or ha what does it look like? Have you been or experienced a class where you have negotiated these objectives and and it's worked out. Uh, what are your thoughts? How I know George, you teach uh, privately. How do you set the goals with your students? How do you know what the goals are? How do, how are those communicated? And how do you work through those throughout the course uh, as you help them improve their English? Again, uh, anyone who'd like to chime in, feel free to either uh, make comments in the chat box or feel free to uh, let me know if you have a microphone. I'd be more than happy to activate the mic if you'd like to uh, talk. So, Alina, what are your uh, thoughts? If you, I'm assuming you teach 
uh, or where you have a, a syllabus or a, a, a curriculum that you must follow. Do you negotiate the objectives? Yes. yes. I just talk to my students. Uh, there is a curriculum, but uh, because I am very experienced teacher, so I was given uh, the big privilege. I can decide what I should teach. So this is totally up to me. And then I come to the group and I give my suggestions. After that, we discuss it. This is like negotiation situation. Of course, I am the leader. I want, I know what I really want to, what kind of messages I'm going to send to them. And the way I talk to them is the way of negotiator. And they are very creative students. So thanks to them, we can form very interesting classes, a very interesting program. So we don't want to be bored. Um, what types of have you uh, different than yeah I have because I am in humanities so I teach um, uh, the Polish culture and Polish history I run the lectures on those topics uh, so <laughs> this is totally up to me what I choose because I, I, I like to update my lectures and the curriculum is mine. Nobody told me what to do. Nobody told me how to teach Polish history because I have the right to talk about Polish history from my perspective. If, of course, I have the books, I have the sources, I have the proofs, and um, example, uh, of course I can. The example is, uh, the, because we are talking about foreigners, so the foreigners come to Poland, and uh, the general idea is they want to learn Polish language, or they want to study in Poland, uh, they can study in English, in French, in German, but they need to come to my uh, lectures about Polish culture and Polish uh, history. So the first meeting is my the list of topics that I, I would like to talk about, and they are free to choose. And we discuss, because from different cultures, uh, people would uh, like to have different discussions, different religion, uh, different discussions about religion. So I am open to all of their suggestions and we form the, the whole semester plan together. That's how it goes. During the class, for example, when I, I talk about Polish, let's say Polish music, I would ask them about their music and they are free to come and show us their music or their dances or their uh, uh, great and famous people. So this is very interactive, very interactive. And when I, mm, I teach Polish, <laughs> I teach advanced Polish um, students and I use different uh, articles from newspapers, magazines. We watch a lot of Polish movies. We watch documentaries. And we also um, use the internet sources. So very often I would go to YouTube, find some nice interview with people, and even the classes. If uh, there are any more questions, I'm here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great, thank you, Alina, for that. Um, ha has anyone used rubrics? I, I've came across a, a website, and I'll go ahead and start screen sharing again and share something that I came across uh, with regard to rubrics, which, which I think ties into self-assessment and this idea of negotiating uh, objectives and basically setting criteria used uh, to evaluate one's work. So I'll go ahead and activate screen share again. 
and I'll show you share with you this post that uh, that I came across. If I can get the screen share activated here, it's taking a little bit longer than usual. Okay, hopefully now you see my screen. And uh, let's see here. Oops, sorry, that's not it. Oh, apologize here. I thought I had it up, queued up here, but I. Here we go. Okay, I came across this blog post, and uh, the, the they talk about building or creating a rubric with students. Now these are young students; these are first graders. Um, but hopefully, you can see this picture. You have. Uh, some descriptors here. You basically have the criteria in which the, uh, the students will be evaluated on the left hand side and you have the degree and quality uh, per, per uh, criterion and then they have the descriptors in each of the box and you'll notice, hopefully you can see this, but they it looks like that uh, these descriptors were developed or negotiated on between the teacher and the students so, for example, this particular rubric, they have pictures, information, and keeping them healthier. And these are the criterion that they're using. Uh, the, the degree in uh, quality here is based on limited, adequate, proficient, and excellent. So you see uh, for each of these that it looks like the students have written in these boxes, uh, descriptors or, describe, or descriptions of uh, what the expectations are for good work and uh, it, it's interesting they mention in this article that uh, when asked this all the students want to do excellent work so I think using rubrics and working with the students in this way is a good way to uh, express expectations uh, both from the teacher and the students about what what it uh, what good work looks like so the question now is uh, rubrics, do you use rubrics? Have you used rubrics? And if you have used them, how do you incorporate those into your own teaching and assessment? And what role do those rubrics play with regard to self-assessment on the part of the student? So have you used rubrics is the question. So Alina, I'll go and ask, start with you again since you have a mic. Uh, Marcus, let, let us know if you have a mic, if you'd like to speak today. The rubrics, you know, it reminds me the beginning of my job where when we had a very strict lots of rubrics and this is why I'm laughing because it's to me of course I have my notes and the students need to be aware of the fact that I use my criteria because the evaluation is constant every meeting is the time for them to show me that they are good that they are good they, they did something nice so while I'm teaching it's uh, the process of my uh, the meetings are four hours meetings every day so uh, the, the, the natural thing is that I make my notes and they know what is an excellent job and they know what is not acceptable but the truth of it is I do not play the rubrics anymore just because maybe of my past with this communist regime they told us to do things and we had to do things this is against my personality <laughs> but they know because I tell them 
it was great. And I tell them it was not okay. And I am making my notes. I have my special teacher's book, and this is what I do. But you would name it rubrics. This could be rubrics. Because the teachers, they do have this kind of system at schools. A lot of papers. Bureaucracy. I'm very much against it. I'm sorry. It makes me laugh. Um, I, how do I communicate my expectations? Very openly. Very openly. First of all, they need to be present. Not only physically, but also emotionally and intellectually. They need to be active, active students. I do not accept passive students. And they know it. And they accept it for some reason. Because I am not like the military officer. Uh, I do not give the orders. I just nicely ask them to do things. And, uh, and just talk them into doing those things and telling them that everything what they do is for them, for themselves. Uh, they know how the good performance looks like because I show them. I show them. I present them myself and of course I also use PowerPoint uh, showing different kinds of expectations. Even, even nonverbal communication is important during the class. I do not accept mean behavior. I do not accept like uh, different kinds of behavior. And they know it. It's not like sit straight. Yes, they have to sit straight. They have to talk to me. If they don't talk to me, it's, it is uh, that they don't know the topic. So they better know. What is this how? Benjamin, you're asking me how, how what? Could you be more specific? Okay. Yeah, so you, you <laughs> and when I teach, uh, teach language, it's also we just repeat things. And again, 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 I do not, first I do not teach writing. I do not teach uh, uh, spelling. I do start with pronunciation expressions, just expressions and uh, collocations and the very basic structures. They need to learn the structures, the expressions, not the isolated words. Lexical approach, this is my way of teaching uh, the vocabulary in the context only in the context and then we read a lot and we watch a lot of um, uh, movies short movies and we make comments on the movies then we sing different kinds of songs and there is also a topic and the story behind the song so this is I do everything possible to make them to be interested in the material. It's very tiring, really. It takes a lot of energy, but I'm a very successful teacher. Thank you. So, Al okay. Alina, I'd like to ask, um, so how do, you, how do your students self-assess or how do you help them uh, recognize uh, their errors that they commit or mistakes that they commit? Um, what uh, how, what does that look like in your classroom? How do you help them with their own uh, reflective practice? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, it's uh, and the class. Who corrects in the, the 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 teaching process? So we just do it together. We just do it together. And then when they have to write something, and nowadays I tell. Them
I don't want this handwriting just for me to correct, but the whole... Everybody during my, the class, passive. passive learner. I do not accept it. I do crazy things to make them be active. Really, very crazy things. And maybe it's also then they know what the expectations are at the end of the semester, and they, of course not the rubrics but i'm i'm giving some uh, some credits for different kinds of activities and uh, and uh, at the end of the semester everybody knows what is the situation and if i feel like i didn't do something good enough i would ask them please tell me what do you think i should change what didn't you like and this is very open discussion. The, the, the evaluation goes both ways. They give me the marks too. <laughs> so, and I'm very, very carefully uh, following their pieces of advice. And this is probably because I like teaching. That's what I do. I'm very much against the formality. Thanks. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, your the first half of your explanation was got cut off. I think we had some audio issues, but uh, but uh, thank you for sharing that. I'd like to conclude here by uh, asking everyone. I'm going to go ahead and give everyone writing controls. But I came across these self-assessment prompts uh, with regard to self-assessment by the student. Uh, this particular article makes a reference uh, distinguishing between self-assessment by the student, self-assessment of the student, but uh, pertaining to self-assessment by the student, self-assessment by the student. Uh, they came up with uh, a few prompts here, and what I'd like to do is I'm going to go ahead and give you write, everyone write controls, and I'd like for you just to indicate which of these prompts, these questions, you deal with in your classroom as a teacher. Uh, the, which of these questions have you used in class that you found uh, useful? You can certainly make uh, comments t towards the right. We've got some space here if you want to make uh, any comments about any of the particular prompts that are listed here. But it, I'd be interested to know of these questions, which ones uh, have you used in your own class to help your students uh, become or use uh, or become better, more reflective uh, students. The first uh, question here is to discuss which question, uh, this question with anyone. So basically they're saying um, whatever issue that, the, the, whatever mistake that they're uh, experiencing or that they've committed, right, have they discussed this issue with, uh, with a classmate or with someone else? Have the students made some sort of checklist of his or her thoughts? Uh, have the students created some sort of mental picture or diagram uh, of either the mistake that they've committed or perhaps a, a solution to uh, their mistake? Have you ever asked your students uh, any additional questions? Have you asked your students to look at different text or other information or content related to the, uh, the problem or the mistake that the student committed? Is the student reviewing his or her own notes? So if they're taking notes, do you ask your students to review the notes that they uh, have created? Ask the student what was uh, discussed in class and or some prior class, so try to reference or link uh, the mistake to something that was already covered in a prior uh, learning experience. Ask the student to perhaps relate the mistake to some real life or authentic uh, experience. Have you tried to just talk with your students about uh, linking these types of mistakes to some sort of song or even perhaps a poem? It doesn't mention poems here, but some sort of artistic 
uh, pursuit? Have you tried to link that with uh, the mistake that they commit? Have you let the student kind of think about the mistake, let it sit for a while, and then come back to it later on? And have you asked the student to try to create another, maybe a related question that uh, links that particular problem or error uh, to something else? So these are a few prompts that they mentioned. Benjamin, this, this is Helena. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Helena. Listen, uh, I would rather uh, ask different question. Not about making mistakes, but about achievements. I would rather talk uh, pointing and underlining the positive aspects of a student's improvement. I would rather try to forget about mistakes because they know they made mistakes and they don't want to make them again. So my encouragement goes towards the positive um, achievements. And of course, in my case, we discuss everything. We discuss our thoughts, we discuss our notes, and everything is discussed. And we also come to our conclusions. How to be a good student, what to do to learn well. And all of this is like motivation, encouragement, and they do work on their own, thinking about what is my improvement. So this is, when they make the mistakes, Benjamin, we correct them ad hoc, immediately. Immediately, we talk about mistakes, and we correct them, and we discuss them. Openness. Good communication is the key. That's what I think. Thank you. Okay, good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great, thanks. And, yeah, so maybe not, maybe we shouldn't focus on the mistakes. We should focus on some of the positive aspects. Um, any other considerations, opinions, uh, Marcus, or anyone else uh, that is listening in? Uh, what about self-assessment, promoting self-assessment uh, in our students? Again, these prompts, whoops, sorry. Uh, these prompts uh, are geared towards helping students become more, uh, more reflective learners and uh, self-assessment basically assessing their own their own work being able to recognize mistakes and uh, perhaps focusing on all of these questions is dwelling on the mistakes and so maybe should we should focus more on some of the positive aspects okay any other comments suggestions or would anyone like to add anything else we're getting close here to, to finish up. I would appreciate, uh, or, or I appreciate actually, everyone uh, attending uh, the live session and for those who are checking out the recording. If you happen to come in late, uh, feel free to check out the recording in Was IQ. Uh, the, it should be there in its entirety. So you can check out the, the recording there. Teacher Talk Time is an ongoing session for basically any educational stakeholder interested in sharing experiences and opinions uh, in, uh, in the classroom. And so I'd encourage everyone to check out uh, this link here at the bottom where it says contribute to topics covered in Teacher Talk Time. Uh, this, is a, this is a Deagle list where you can see upcoming uh, websites that, uh, that I've come across but you can also uh, 
voice your opinion on certain topics that you would like to cover uh, during these open sessions. Again, this is an open forum for educators, anyone who would like to share uh, their experiences, opinions on uh, what's going on in the classroom, anything related to teaching and learning. And so I encourage uh, all of you who are uh, here and listening to the recording uh, to to participate and uh, we'll have another session here in about two more weeks. Uh, next week I'm going to a conference in the United States so I will be I won't be available so I'll be back in two weeks and we'll talk uh, uh, we'll talk again hopefully and so again thank you everyone for being here and we'll see you next time.